Good afternoon and welcome to Vermont House Judiciary Committee. It is Tuesday, May 11th, and we are continuing our consideration of S7, a bill relating to sealing and expungement. And uh, we'll be looking at draft 2.3, which is on our committee page under attorney Bryn Hare's name. And so you can find that there. Uh, when we last met on this bill, the administration raised concerns about the, um, the last draft, um, as well as the state's attorney raised uh, concerns regarding unknown, unknown crimes and uh, potential unintended consequences to, uh, to victims. Um, so what you see in draft 2.3 is a, um, hopefully, uh, a, a bill that balances the important goals of sealing and expungement and public safety. Um, so in working on this draft, one of the things that I did was I asked Crime Research Group to um, send me a list of the non-listed misdemeanors, because those were ones that uh, specifically the state's attorney raised concern about. And so, and they're posted, the list is posted, and I scanned all 846 of them. And I pulled out um, ones that I identified as misdemeanors that could be related to or a result of domestic violence. And so when Bryn does a walkthrough, you'll see that, that those um, are in here and are ineligible for sealing and expungement. And I've been working um, with the Attorney General's office to make these changes um, and we will see what you what you think. And again, I know that some of our witnesses are just joining in after I said this earlier. I do understand that you have not, may not have had a chance to review the bill. Uh, hopefully, um, Attorney Hare's walkthrough and then also hearing from the Attorney General's office will be helpful. But if you are not prepared to testify, uh, please let me know. So with that, welcome, Bryn. Thank you. Thank you and good afternoon committee. For the record, Bryn Hare from Legislative Council here to talk about draft 2.3 of S7. And um, I'm gonna just go ahead and walk through it without sharing my screen. That's typically how you like to do it. Um, you, you should have it on your committee webpage. And as always, the new draft um, has all of the changes from the, from, from the prior version that you looked at in yellow highlight. And you'll also see um, some underlined and struck through language. And that just is to signify what was in the former uh, draft that is not in this version. So I'm gonna jump right into the walkthrough. So you've got time to potentially hear from witnesses. So there are no changes to section one. Um, you'll, the committee will remember this is the listed crimes definition that has some technical revisions to account for some changed cross-references and some updated terminology. So there are no changes there. Also no changes to section two, which is the surcharge um, section that implements that provision from last year that allows surcharges to be waived by judges um, for sealing or expungement proceedings if the petitioner demonstrates an inability to pay. So the first change you'll see is in section three, which starts at the bottom of page four, um, but you'll have to scroll down to page five to see the new language. And this is the definition of qualifying crime. So as everybody remembers, qualifying crimes are those crimes that are eligible under the sealing or expungement chapter um, for sealing or expungement if certain criteria are met. So um, the changes here, if you remember, the, the draft as it came over from the Senate um, provided that all misdemeanor crimes were eligible for expungement, except listed misdemeanors. So um, this changes the definition of qualifying crimes um, or crimes that are eligible for sealing or expungement. And the effect here is to reduce the number of misdemeanors um, that are eligible for expungement or sealing, reduce it from the Senate version and also from actually from existing law, what is eligible under existing law. So instead it provides that uh, qualifying misdemeanors are all misdemeanors that are not listed crimes, that are not sexual exploitation of children crimes, that are not a violation of an order of protection or a violation of an uh, abuse prevention order, that are not offenses involving um, abuse, neglect, or exploitation of, of vulnerable adults, 
um, misdemeanors that are not voyeurism crimes, um, not cruelty to animals, not aggravated disorderly conduct, not neglect of duty by a public officer, not failure to comply with sex offender registry requirements. Uh, they cannot be obscenity offenses that are related to minors. So that would include for um, dissemination of indecent material to a minor in the presence of a minor or outside the presence of a minor, exhibition of motion pictures or displaying obscene materials to minors. Those are all excluded. Um, also, what is the last two that are excluded are um, hate motivated crime enhancements or um, burning of a cross or a religious symbol. So what I just listed to you is a long list of what is excluded. Um, so as the chair mentioned earlier, she reviewed um, the list of misdemeanors that are not listed crimes, and that's a list of over 800 um, individual crimes. So what, what this draft does is it provides that all misdemeanors except for those that I just listed would be eligible. And as I mentioned at the outset, um, this actually narrows the scope of misdemeanors that are um, eligible for expungement or sealing from the prior draft. And it also um, narrows it, changes it, and narrows it somewhat from what is eligible under existing law. Um, so I'm going to keep going unless there are section questions about that. I'm going to keep keep moving through the the qualifying crimes definition to the felonies next. Uh, Barbara has a question. Go ahead. Um, Bryn, can you just say which ones are um, changed from existing law that this bill would um, make so if you, more? If you look at the definition of qualifying crime at the bottom yeah. of page five. Yep. What is currently eligible yep. is misdemeanor offenses that are not listed crimes right. and that are not offenses involving sexual exploitation of children, cannot be offenses involving um, a violation of an order of protection. And then if you scroll down to um, page six, you'll see that struck through language prostitution is currently not eligible. Um, and predicate offenses are currently not eligible. So those are now, so predicate of misdemeanors are now eligible under the bill. Um, prostitution is now eligible, but those prior ones that are that are listed in underline and yellow highlight would not be eligible. And they currently are. Yes. Okay, thank you. Okay, so I'm gonna keep moving down to page seven. So um, starting with um, what is that struck through subsection D on line two, this is the beginning of the list of felony crimes that are eligible, are considered qualifying crimes for purposes of sealing or expungement. So um, starting on page two or line two, that is those certain burglary offenses. Um, those are currently eligible. Um, scrolling down to page eight, subdivision C, um, offenses relating to the possession of regulated drugs. These are also currently eligible. It's underlined because we've collapsed it into one subdivision here, but you can see the struck through provisions above it are all the um, existing law that provides that um, offenses relating to possession of regulated drugs are eligible. Subdivision uh, D, are offenses relating to the sale, dispensation, or transport of regulated drugs. So this is um, these are, are now eligible under this draft, not currently eligible. But you'll see that that um, yellow highlight struck through provision 4234AB, um, that is the sale or, trans or transport or dispensation of methamphetamines. So by striking that through, that means that you would be removing sale, dispensation, or transport of methamphetamines from the list of qualifying felony offenses. Tom, go ahead. Thank you. I'm pretty sure I know the answer to it, Bryn, but in D, selling, dispensing, and transporting, um, that's totally different than trafficking, right? Correct. Does not include yeah. trafficking. That's a separate subdivision under those sections of law. Right, thank you. 
And then I don't see any more questions, so I'll keep going. Um, subdivision E is those qualifying felony property offenses that are listed in the, in the definition that appears, um, I think, a little bit further down. Um, so that, that is the list, but there is a change to what is considered a felony um, property offense. And you'll see on page nine, there have been two felony property offenses that have been struck through. So these would no longer be eligible uh, for sealing or expungement. And that is um, an offense related to larceny from the person. And you heard um, testimony from witnesses about that particular crime last week. And also offenses relating to holding property in an official capacity or property belonging to the state or a municipality. So that is also removed from the list. So therefore no longer eligible for sealing or expungement. So the, um, the, that concludes the part of the bill that talks about what offenses are eligible, just as a, as a baseline starting point, what is eligible for sealing or expungement? Are there questions about that before I move on? Uh, so Bob and then Tom. Thank you. Brent, could you give me an example of section 2537 holding a property in official capacity belonging to the state or municipality? So I bet that a witness will be able to give a better example of what that is. Um, but I can pull up the statute for you. If you give me a moment. While she's doing that, I had the same question, so I took my hand down. So this is under the larceny and embezzlement chapter. So um, this would be a state, county, town, or municipal officer or another person who um, holds an official capacity, who receives, collects, controls, or holds money, obligations, securities, or other property, who embezzles or fraudulently converts that to their own use. Um, so it's essentially an embezzlement crime committed by a person who is um, a state, county, town, or municipal officer operating in an official capacity. Thank you. Sure. Yeah. Okay, I think you're good to go. <laughs> okay, great. <laughs> okay, so um, I'm gonna move on to section four now, and this is uh, the section that details the requirements for um, the different categories of qualifying offenses and how um, they are eligible for sealing or expungement. So the first change that you see here um, is on page 12. And this is the um, subdivision five. This is the language that you looked at in the last draft that provides that a person who's under the supervision of the department um, is not eligible to have their um, a record of an offense sealed or expunged under the chapter. Um, and the, the change here provides that just creates a little exception to that rule. So except for those records of offenses where the underlying conduct is no longer prohibited by law or no longer designated as a criminal offense, um, a person shall not be able to um, have their record sealed or expunged if they're under the supervision of the department. But it, that language there means that that, shall, that requirement shall not apply um, if, the, if the petition is for uh, an offense that is no longer considered criminal. And I believe that it was Representative Colburn that pointed, pointed that out in the hearing that you had about the bill last week. And then the next change is on the top of page 14. Um, you'll see some language there in yellow highlight. I'll just explain what this section is first. This is subsection B. So these are qualifying non-predicate misdemeanors and possession of a controlled substance offenses. So I'm just gonna remind the committee that for this category of offense, 
These are eligible for expungement five years after the person completed their sentence for the crime or five years after completing the sentence for a subsequent offense, whichever one is later. Um, and this provides that if the state stipulates to a petition to seal or expunge, the court can grant that petition without a hearing on or after the date that the offense is eligible for sealing or expungement according to the statute. And then the new language here provides that if the person didn't commit a subsequent offense, then the respondent can stipulate um, to a petition filed prior to the date that the offense is eligible under the statute. And the court is, may grant that petition without a hearing if it makes a finding that the person has successfully completed any required rehabilitation to the satisfaction of the court. Um, and so this change is made um, in, a, in another couple of places in this section. And this was really intended to address the concerns um, that you heard from the administration last week, some of those concerns. I don't see any questions, so I'm going to move on to subsection C, and this is the next category of crimes, which are qualifying predicate misdemeanors. And as a reminder, these types of crimes are eligible for sealing rather than expungement five years after the sentence completion date or five years after the sentence completion date for a subsequent offense, whichever one is later. And then those sealed records are expungement eligible five years after sealing if the person doesn't commit a subsequent offense. And so the change here you'll find on page 16, this is gonna look very similar. So same language here, um, the respondent, the state can stipulate um, to a petition that's filed on or after the date that the offense is eligible for sealing or expungement and the court may grant that petition without a hearing. And then if the person does not commit a subsequent offense, then the respondent can stipulate to that petition that's filed prior to the date that the offense is eligible. And I'm gonna note that I can remove the word for expungement or because they are not eligible for expungement if they've committed a subsequent offense. So I'll just make a note of that. Um, and the, again, the court can grant that petition, that early petition, um, if it makes a finding that the person has successfully completed any required rehabilitation to the satisfaction of the court. Don't see any hands, so I'm just going to keep trucking along here. So um, if you scroll down to page 18, um, subsection I, these are the qualifying property offenses and offenses um, related to the sale, dispensation, or transport of regulated drugs. Um, so this, I'm just going to remind the committee, this is, these are eligible. These are sealing eligible eight years after um, the date on which the person completed the sentence for the offense or eight years from the date the person completed a sentence for a subsequent offense, whichever one is later. And then those sealed offenses are expungement eligible eight years after the date that the sealing order is issued, as long as the person does not commit a subsequent offense. And then if you look on page 19, subdivision three, that this is the language that provides that the state can stipulate to a petition that's filed on or after the date that the offense is eligible. Um, and the court can grant that petition without a hearing. I just wanted to draw your attention to the fact that these offenses are not eligible for a, an early petition to seal or expunge. Tom, go ahead. Thank you. Uh, so, Brand, I just need some clarification. So, uh, we'll use the eight year. So, um, uh, I paid uh, I paid my dues. Uh, the eight year has started. Um, I, I have a violation of some kind. Uh, I, I I pay. Uh, you know, I I, I um, pay the penalties on that. Um, so, when that when that is satisfied, does the eight, would the eight years start over at that point for an expungement on a prior crime? So the eight years start once you've um, satisfied the judgment. 
So once you've completed any payment um, or or com- or completed your your term if you're incarcerated, yeah. Um, once you've satisfied the judgment, that's when the eight years begins. So if you if you satisfy the judgment for that offense for which you're sealing you're seeking a uh, a sealing or expungement order, and then you commit an ad- an additional crime during that eight year period, then you have to wait from the time that you complete your sentence for the subsequent crime eight years from the date you complete that sentence before you can <clears throat> petition the court to seal or expunge the f- record of the first crime. Okay, say so if, if I went four years, uh, then had. Uh, the new crime, it's still, it'll be eight years when that is satisfied. Right. So okay. ultimately you have to have eight years clean is one, is one right. way to put it. Eight years yeah. where, you're, where you're not serving a, a, a sentence. Right. Yeah. I just wanted to get the timeline straight on it. Thank you. Sure. Okay. <clears throat> I'm going to, I'll, I'll keep moving now. Um, so there is one change to section five, which is the effective ceiling section. Um, and this, I think that you heard some testimony from the court last week about wh- how they would contact a person. Um, and if you remember, this is the section that provides that the court has to provide reasonable notice to a person who's had their record sealed, that they may be eligible, that sealed record may be eligible for expungement. And you heard some testimony that the, the, the way it was drafted in the Senate version was not um, how the court would, would do that notification. So we've just made a small change here to define reasonable effort as attempting to notify the person by electronic means rather than a phone call or first class mail at the person's last known address. And then there are no changes to section six skip over that section. Section seven, this is the um, expungement of Judicial Bureau records, and there is um, a change here, and you'll see that on page 24. So uh, page 24, subdivision two, this is the language that provides that um, once a conviction or adjudication has been expunged, it can't appear in any existing database. And then we've just added some language here that provides except for as provided in subsection C. And if you scroll down to subsection C, this creates an exception for research entities. Um, So the language here provides that any research entity that maintains these um, conviction or adjudication records for purposes of collecting, analyzing, and disseminating criminal justice data um, will not be required to expunge those records. And then you've also have, there's an additional sentence that provides that research entities have to abide by the policies that are established by the court administrator and shall not disclose any identifying information from the records they maintain. And this was in response to, um, I believe some written testimony that appears on your committee webpage from the crime research group that um, they do have access to these records and would like to um, not be required to expunge these records um, because that would interfere with the with the research that they do in response to legislative requests. Uh, Ken, I saw your hand go up and down. I just want to make sure that you don't have a question. I can't I can't see my hand, but uh, thank you. Why isn't the phone call attempted phone call or something in there? I think we're going to get beat up if there's. Uh, if that's not in there, last, last known uh, phone at, uh, number or something like that, shouldn't that be in there? So um, you heard some testimony from Judge Grierson last week that um, that the court staff really would not be um, would not be the appropriate people to give a phone call to notify a person and how they typically notify people is by electronic means um, or by by mail. So it's not how they typically conduct their notifications of people. Um, and, I, and I'm not sure if Judge Gerson is available now to jump in, but um, that is my recollection of his testimony. So that, that is up to the court to, um, to notify? 
the that the directive is to the court to issue that notification. Yes. Okay. Thank you, Brent. Sure. You want me to wait in, Chair Craig? Sure. Thank you. J just uh, to clarify. Um, the whole provision about uh, notifying uh, someone who's just had a sealed record that there is a possibility of expungement is something new to the law anyway. Um, and what I had indicated before was that it's it's unrealistic to have uh, court personnel um, reach out to someone by telephone um, for a number of reasons. One, we probably don't have a, a recent telephone number, uh, but even more importantly, uh, there would really be no record of a phone call. Um, and what's important, if, if notice means anything, it, you need to be able to document it. Um, and then it would put the, the uh, staff person um, in the middle of, of a, uh, a process where they could become a witness. And uh, if it's going to be effective at all, I think it'll be effective at the time the person receives an order uh, that their record has been sealed and to let them know at the same time uh, that there is a possibility of expungement if they meet criteria, and that would seemingly go out w w at the same time as the order or even part of the order uh, of sealing, and that would be the most effective means of notifying someone. Thank you. Thank you. Can I see your hand up? Thank you. It is. I'm having a little bit of trouble here today. I don't mean to. It's, I don't mean to. So... So you, you don't have a question or you're, you're all set. OK, thank you. Thank you. OK, so thank you to Judge Grierson for clarifying that uh, for me. So I'm going to move on to Section 8. And this is the section that directs the Joint Legislative Justice Oversight Committee to do an expungement and sealing study during the legislative interim. And the language has been changed here. Um, so the directive, rather than have the directive be to develop a comprehensive policy that provides um, some type of avenue for expungement or sealing for all criminal offenses, except for the Big 12. Um, instead, you're directing the committee to consider all qualifying misdemeanors and whether to exclude any of those qualifying misdemeanors from sealing or expungement eligibility, in particular um, misdemeanors associated with and resulting from domestic and sexual violence. And um, I believe, and one thing I didn't do in this draft I'm noticing is point out simple assault. I believe that um, the proposal was to include specifically simple assault to evaluate simple assault for whether or not that should be eligible for sealing or expungement. I could make that note. So also that language, struck through language in subdivision one so you're no longer directing the committee to um, develop a policy to make all criminal history records eligible for expungement or sealing except for big 12s. And instead you're directing them to um, review those eligible misdemeanors to determine if any of them should no longer be eligible for sealing or expungement. Also to determine what individuals or entities should have access to sealed um, records and whether you should continue to go along the two-track process of sealing and expungement, or if you should um, limit eligibility to just one or the other. And then lastly, um, how to implement an automated process or a petitionless process um, that would provide for notice to the prosecuting office and an opportunity for the prosecutor to oppose that sealing or expungement. Thank you, Bryn. Uh, Selena. Um, yes, so I'm reading um, <clears throat> the beginning of section eight here, <clears throat> excuse me, and I noticed that some of the language that's struck through is develop a comprehensive policy that provides an avenue for expungement or sealing of all offenses except those listed in 33 VSA 5204A, and that's really replaced by actually thinking about which misdemeanors should not be eligible. And so I guess I'm trying to understand, is this a narrowing of the scope of the study, which looked like it was originally about expansion and this seems to be 
the 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 clearest direction here seems to be about you know thinking about <clears throat> exclusions um although i know that the the language I mean, it says shall consider how to simplify and automate the process of expungement and sealing of criminal history records. But I guess I'm I'm reading this as like a kind of a um, replacing what had been a pretty expansive charge for the study about really looking at a bigger rubric for most offenses with looking at what might be excluded um, from the universe of misdemeanors. And I just, I'm wondering if I'm, if you think I'm reading that right or wrong. If that is a question for me, I think that you're reading that right. Okay. So, yeah, and um, thank you, Selena. Certainly that's up for discussion. Yeah. Not seeing any other hands, committee members. Uh, Martin. This is a real short question, something I probably should have picked up on before. On, on page nine, one of the crimes that we list, uh, section 2575A related to organized retail theft, that's not a crime yet. That's uh, hung up in H87, which hasn't been passed. I don't know how one would deal with that since it's uh, this bill is moving before that bill apparently. Just want to flag that. Thank you. I'll make a note of that. So is your hand up? Um, okay. No, you're good. Okay. Tom. Yeah, um, we, we had discussed at another time um, at early expungements that, that a prosecutor could um, ask for an early expungement. Is that the way that was? And what's the status on that now? So um, that was changed throughout anywhere where an early expungement was, um, a person had the opportunity to file for an early expungement. It now provides that um, the person can only be eligible to petition for an early expungement if they haven't committed a subsequent offense. And also, um, if the court grants that early expungement, first of all, the state has to stipulate to the early petition. And also, the court has to make a finding that the person has been um, rehabbed to the satisfaction of the court. Okay, so it's the court's decision now and, and uh, not the prosecutor. Correct. I, it, okay. as, if the prosecutor stipulates, the court has to make that finding before it can grant the, any early petition. Okay, great. Thank you. Anybody else before we move to the Attorney General's office? I don't think so. Okay, I'd like to please welcome David Shearer, the Attorney General's office. Good afternoon, committee. Good afternoon, Madam Chair. Thank you for having me this afternoon. So I'm gonna limit my comments. I, I already uh, testified um, in response to an, an earlier round of testimony. So I, I don't wanna go into some of the substance that's already been covered, but I do wanna focus my comments today just on the pieces that are specifically responsive to administration concerns and then happy to answer questions. And then after other witnesses testify, if there's return, you know, other larger questions, I'm happy to talk about that as well. But of course, I'll answer whatever questions come up. So starting on pages five and six, really on page six, one of the specific concerns that had come up, I should say the chair already outlined the sort of rubric under which she reviewed the eligible misdemeanors, which are a large number now, and they have been expanded significantly because of the elimination of the predicate offense, the prohibition on uh, expunging predicate offenses. So that was a large expansion um, in this bill. And so now there's been a bit of a, a narrowing uh, with an eye towards, as the chair talked about uh, her review and eyeing, the, uh, with, with an eye towards specifically issues related to domestic violence and uh, sexual offenses. One, the one other piece in there is the neglect of duty by a public officer, which had been brought up, I believe, by the state's attorney's office and um, 
uh, I think the administration as well, but I remember the state's attorney's office mentioning that. Uh, moving on down here to page eight, this elimination of the methamphetamine sales piece was again responsive to administration concerns. And we felt that, um, you know, it was a reasonable uh, accommodation. And uh, we do think it's important to allow for people to move past these offenses. Uh, it is our view that um, really the vast majority of these offenses, when you're in the courtrooms and watching what's actually happening with the various cases, with the affidavits, with the plea deals that actually the people uh, where they admit to wrongful behavior, criminal behavior, it is the vast majority of these dealing offenses are people who are not capitalists, commercial enterprisers, people like that. These are people who are dealing to um, sustain themselves, uh, maybe doing a sale here and there to sustain an addiction, a substance use disorder, you know, trying to uh, keep themselves alive. Um, so we think it's, it's important to keep most of those in, but if there was, um, and especially since in Vermont, historically, uh, meth dealing has certainly been present, but has not been uh, a huge aspect, I would say a huge percentage of the offenses uh, as a, by compare, you know, by contrast with heroin and uh, in particular, um, and some of the other substances that this is an accommodation that was reasonable and it still kept in the bulk of the policy decision here. Um, Moving down to nine, this was the, again, reflecting administration concerns about larceny from a person and uh, which is section 2503. And then the next highlighted cross out is section 2537, which is basically the embezzlement as it relates to a public, somebody holding a position of public trust, so like a town clerk or something like that. Uh, again, keeping in the, the great majority of the offenses in that paragraph. Um, and there were really two other main pieces that uh, were discussed, and one of them was accommodated on page four, well, it's in the same way, accommodated on page 14 and page 16. The administration had demonstrated a lot of discomfort with the waiver of timeline, saying their argument, I believe, hopefully I'll state it fairly, was that that undermined some of the policy um, policy impetus behind expansive expungements because um, the data is really about a, a time period after which, uh, after an offense during which somebody is not reoffended. And, but their suggestion, they, they wrote out some suggestions and their suggestions actually were not to eliminate the ability for uh, a timeline waiver, but simply to have a judge review that timeline waiver. Um, so that is that was embodied in this paragraph here. Timeline waiver is still available for the five-year offenses um, if there hasn't been a subsequent offense, and um, then a judge can review it, but a judge doesn't have to hold a hearing on it. Um, they can make that decision. Uh, of course, they could always, at their discretion, choose to hold a hearing uh, to hear that issue if they if they wanted to. Um, and the same accommodation is on page 16. The only other piece that we'd heard clearly a discomfort with was the idea that somebody could get an offense expunged very shortly after a subsequent offense or finishing a sentence for subsequent. But we, I believe that was actually a misreading of the statute. I, I do think as attorney Hare explained again just a few minutes ago, um, you cannot, the, 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 the timeline restarts from the day that you satisfy the sentence for the subsequent offense. So it is, you, you do have to wait out that timeline from the time that you satisfy that, that subs, the sentence on the subsequent offense. So that's already in the statute. And that was really it um, in terms of, you know, like specific pieces that we'd heard about, um, and actually thought that these were things that we could, uh, we were willing to accept. Uh, I think it would have been more difficult to accept the elimination of uh, the timeline waiver entirely, but allowing it to go forward in these circumstances is still um, 
something that we think is a reasonable accommodation. And in fact, and I speak for myself, I know there are other witnesses who will have a more comprehensive viewpoint. Um, I think that this will still allow a lot of the expungement requests we get very high percentage to go forward since most of them are subsequent to the timeline. And uh, for the ones that aren't, it still allows that there still is an avenue for that. So that that covers the the summary of changes that were directly responsive to administration concerns. We certainly hope that those um, are reasonable responses and uh, accommodate those concerns. And I'm happy to take any questions. Um, David, you, you heard um, questions about the study. Uh, just wondering if um, you had a chance to think about that and reverting to, to a larger a larger look, more expansive look than, than what's here. Yeah, I think that is a, a very good point. I hadn't uh, fully absorbed that until it was brought up. So thank you to Representative Colburn for pointing that out. I think it certainly we would be supportive of having the broader look. I think that makes sense. I think um, that will give everybody a chance to have a really comprehensive look about how this should move forward. And, and I think we'd be supportive of maintaining that. I, I also, I think that both can be done though. I, I don't think that that means that we can't ask important questions about how we deal with um, offenses associated with domestic and sexual violence. Um, but I think that naming specifically that we're gonna have a comprehensive look is something that is worth including and maintaining in this draft. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, Barbara. Thank you. Um, so David, this may not be a question for you, but um, where we removed, um, no, where this proposed bill removes people from having the opportunity to get their records sealed or expunged that currently would have it, are there problems with those particular cases that you're aware of that we would go backwards? And you're talking about the um, the stuff at the beginning five, on pages five and six? Uh, let me, I have to go back and see what page it's on. The oh, ones that okay. yellow that Bryn. Right, right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I don't view these these changes as again some of this is um a little bit anecdotal i'm going on my reviews but i have been i have assisted at a good number of expungement clinics now so i've seen a lot of requests come through uh -huh. um i think requests for these offenses are fairly rare and they are in the sort of grands you know as you think of the percentages of cases that come through our system, these are on the lower end and they're, they're more unusual offenses as compared to say, um, uh, like a disorderly conduct or a simple assault or things like that, which you see a huge volume of those offenses coming through. Um, these are, are relatively unusual and I think the expungement requests are relatively unusual. And I think that um, it's not going to have a huge sort of backward step. It's important to remember that in the misdemeanors as a whole, I think it's still a very large, it's a, not very large, but it is an expansion because you are now allowing for prohibited, I mean, sorry, um, uh, predicate uh, uh, misdemeanors to be included, which is a, a significant step forward um, and will include things like careless and negligent operation, which is a fairly common offense. And we think, again, that's a very reasonable one to allow to be eligible. Uh, so I think on balance, this still is a significant step forward in terms of the overall volume of eligibility that will be um, available after if this were to become law. Uh, and you know, with some of them, I will say uh, neglect of duty by a public officer in particular, that's actually one that our office has objected to requests on because okay. I think I explained last time that was one where we felt like it is inappropriate for the government to be assisting somebody and putting a veil over government wrongdoing. Um, right, right. And I, so I, that was, I think, yeah I, yeah, I think the two that sort of, I mean, many of them, it's hard to say, oh, why would we want to let somebody who's not complying with the sex offender registry 
but the ones that seem sort of um, possibly not, I mean, maybe I'm just wrong about this, but um, the aggravated disorderly conduct may very well be somebody very drunk who, yeah, I don't know. That, that one seems kind of squishy to me in terms of who could fall in that, as well as probably the violation related to obscenity. Like, just, I don't know what's included in that, but those two seem like, yeah, why, why are those, why don't we let people um, repent from those two in particular? Um, I don't know. I guess being a social worker, I have a strong belief that people can change. And so with lots of them, I believe that people can, you know, come around. But in particular, those I just worry about getting, you know, some people who weren't involved with anything all that serious um, that may be related to mental health or addiction, um, not get a break. I certainly understand your point. I think it, you raise a good, good, important points that get to the heart of why we are considering expungements. I think with aggravated disorderly conduct, there is some data showing that a lot of, um, or some decent percentage of domestic assaults get pled down to aggravated disorderly. It is a different type of offense than regular disorderly conduct in that it is behavior that is very specifically directed at a singular person, which is, a, a different type of behavior than the sort of general disruptiveness. Um, so that, a bar fight over a pool game might be, you know what I mean? Like, is that, would that be that kind of aggravated disorderly conduct if the person feels like the other person cheated? No, well, something like that would probably be, end up being a, a simple assault or uh, something of that nature. This is more, it's more in the nature and that stalking is a different crime, so I don't wanna use that word, but it's more in the nature right. of um, sort of directed harassment, again, which is also a different crime. So I'm using poor, right. I'm making poor word choices here, but it's like very directed, challenging behavior towards a specific person, which is why you see domestics get fled down to it because it fits a similar type of um, mindset and behavior. Okay, and how about with the um, uh, obscenity? I think the idea there has, is more around um, its relationship to child sexual abuse materials and the overlay that those two things can have with each other at times. So not swearing or giving someone an obscene gesture, or we're not talking about that? No. Okay, that's... Good to know. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Barbara, for those are good questions. Uh, Bob. Yes, thank you. So, David, I just wanted you to elaborate somewhat on Section I, where it says qualifying felony properties, offenses, selling dispensing or transportation of regulated substances. You're saying the attorney general's office supports this for the expungement? We do, and you're talking about, yes, we do. And, um, and again, I think it's the notion that, but it's important to remember what we're talking about here, which is not that these things should never be policed, prosecuted, um, penalties shouldn't be served. That's not the argument. It's just that if somebody has in fact um, served out their penalty, whatever that may have been, maintained, uh, you know, hasn't had issues for uh, the appropriate number of years, then we do think it's reasonable to allow that person to move on. And uh, again, the data shows that um, after, and uh, David DeMora testified to this more comprehensively than I can, but uh, with especially those nonviolent offenses, I believe he was saying that the data shows that around five years after that, um, you're looking at a likelihood to reoffend that goes down to about the level of the average person in the general population. So there isn't really a compelling public safety purpose to hang the record on somebody. And there's very important countervailing uh, public policy reasons not to 
make that person labor under that, including their ability to earn a good income and access good jobs and expanding the state's labor force. And, and all of those things are also things that allow that make it less likely for somebody to reoffend. So we do, in fact, support that. And again, we don't view those offenses as primarily being the sort of serious. I mean, if you're in a, there's there's this, I, I'd say a somewhat fictional version of it's you're either you're there's the bad drug dealers and then there's the substance use of uh, disorder folks who are who get charged with drug possession and that's just not the reality as we see it i think a lot of people are suffering from substance use disorder do end up making trades or making small very small time sales that amount to uh, drug sales and and that's a piece of what happens but it doesn't make those people into the type of sort of big time capitalistic predatory dealers that I think is sometimes the shorthand uh, idea of what that is. And that just isn't the reality we see in the courtrooms. So because they're addicted to a drug and they may be selling on the street <clears throat> and to whomever for profit but for themselves, this is, this is all right. And, and creating more addiction in the process? I don't think it's a matter of what's, uh, again, it's not a matter of whether things should be policed or punished. Although again, I, we do believe that for those issues, treatment is the more effective thing in terms of promoting public safety and helping those people. Uh, but it's not so much a matter of what should or shouldn't be a penalty. We're not legalizing anything here. We're just saying that it should be eligible for expungement after an appropriate number of years. And there hasn't been a, a reoffense for that number of years. That is a reasonable, policy decision, and uh, it's one that we agree with. And again, I think it, it's important. The reality that we often see in these cases is not somebody who's like a consistent, all right, I'm going to go out and I'm going to sell a bunch of, I'm going to sell a package of whatever today. It's like one, you know, they make one sale between friends or something like that. And that's the one that the CI, that the local officers have, have them do this do the trade with or do the sale with. Again, I, I do want to sort of try to provide a corrective to that notion that uh, a lot of this stuff is any type of like consistent organized sales behavior. That's just not a lot of what happens here. That's a very tiny percentage of what you actually see in terms of what gets pulled into court on, on uh, cases dealing with substance use disorder. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Any other questions for the Attorney General's office? Thank you. Thank you, David. Thank you. Appreciate it. So, Commissioner Sherling, are you prepared to, to testify today? Again, I know that you have not had much time with, with the draft. But if you are able to comment, we I welcome your comments. Maybe he's not here. <laughs> uh, okay. Uh, Dale Crook, DOC. Uh Good afternoon, Madam Chair. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to testify. For the record, my name is Dale Crook. I am the Director of Field Services for the Vermont Department of Corrections. Um, I'm really just going to focus the comments on the two parts that would impact the department and not the the, the greater area of the of the bill. Um, you know, as we testify, as I testified last week, we had a concern about the impact of risk assessments. I think some of the carve outs that were added recently would help uh, address some of those concerns. Uh, doesn't eliminate them, but they're um, but, but removing certain offenses like voyeurism uh, does uh, re reduce that concern that the department have on impacts of risk assessments. Um, there may be a few others. Uh, 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 as you indicated, we didn't have a lot of time with, with the bill and um, there's a lot of offenses, um, but I think you, the ones that were added uh, did have some uh, uh, of an impact of reducing some of the concerns. 
Uh, there may be some others. I'm trying to go through the 800 something lists um, that, that may have it. Um, but I think overall, if there's something else I can have uh, testimony written in tomorrow, uh, once we have a better chance to look at it. Um, the only other section I'll, I'll really talk about was, was the addition to, I think it was page 12. Um, I can understand the, the language that was added um, for uh, since it's no longer a criminal offense. Um, I really don't know, know how much of an impact that's going to be on the department. Um, you know, as we testify, as I testified before, uh, the department doesn't supervise uh, uh, its clients and its population based on offenses. Um, so, so not knowing how much of an impact that would be, it's hard to understand. Well, I can understand the logic behind the request. Um, if we have risk assessments and pre-sentence investigations and other work material, um, that could be uh, an impact on, on, on a workload impact there. Um, I'm not really sure how many crimes that would be other than, you know, the ones that come to mind would be the, um, the marijuana, ch changes to the marijuana laws in the last couple of years. I don't think it would be a huge impact, um, but that would be the other concern. Um, uh, other than that, I think that's what the department would testify to, and I'd be happy to answer any questions um, or, or not. Thank you. Thank you very much. Committee members, uh, uh, Selena. Yeah, could I, I'm I'm hoping you could just restate for me your concern about um, marijuana expungements. It's it's not as much as a crime. So the department supervises individuals. We don't do it based on offenses. We do it based on the individual. So we could have an individual that we're supervising for a handful of different charges. Uh, but we don't supervise each individual individual charge. We supervise the individual themselves. So we'd have risk assessments. Um, we would have uh, pre-sentence investigations or enemy sanction reports, um, case staffing reports that are done taking the individual as a whole. And if we expunge one of those crimes in that case, all that work material is is impacted uh, because the way that expungements is, is worded is that that offense has never happened. So uh, a risk assessment involving other crimes and the one that never happened, we would probably have to redo that risk assessment. For a pre-sentence investigation, it may not be um, useful and as useful anymore. Again, I don't know how much of an impact that will be because I'm not sure how many uh, cases are out there that are no longer crimes that we have under under um, supervision. So it sounds like the concern is more about just the labor of having to redo the risk assessment and less about the implications yeah. of no longer being able to factor, say, a marijuana possession connection into the risk assessment. Yeah, it's an administrative burden is, is, is what it would be. Um, so any any work product that had the expunged case uh, involved with it would no longer be valid. So that we'd have to go and redact case notes, uh, depending on how long the individual has been under supervision, it could be uh, quite a few case notes we'd have to go through and redact. Um, that's the concern. Um, again, not knowing the impact of, of that with how many individuals we have, that may not be many, and there may not be um, a huge desire to request expungements while someone's still under supervision. So I, it's it's hard to to know what that impact would be, but that's the concern that we would have. Thank you. Any anybody else? Thank you. Thank you, Dale. Uh, uh, Judge Grierson, you're able to testify. And again, my apologies for um, sending this so late, uh, but there is a little bit of extra work for the court to do. <laughs> there is. I, uh, 
Thank you, Madam Chair, for inviting us to testify. For the record, Brian Grierson, Chief Superior Judge. I have uh, circulated the um, uh, the bill of the proposed amendments um, within uh, my office. I haven't received back all the responses, so I'll tell you what my initial thoughts are. And if I find there's a need to come back, uh, I'll, I'll let the committee know. Um, so the first section were the crimes uh, that are, are eligible. Um, I, I don't have anything to offer on that. Uh, it's purely a uh, policy decision on the part of the legislature. I would skip down to the sections on page 14 and 16, which are similar. And they talk about this idea of uh, an early expungement. Uh, I think this is if the person did not commit a subsequent offense, the respondent may stipulate to a petition filed prior to the date of the offense uh, is eligible for expungement or sealing as set forth in this subsection, and the court may grant the petition without a hearing if it finds the person successfully completed any required rehabilitation. So I, I'm not sure the source of, of this uh, language. Uh, two things I would point out. One, I don't know the last clause, if it finds the person successfully completed any required rehabilitation. Um, first of all, we'd have to have a hearing in order to determine that. But more importantly, if you keep in mind that the person would not be seeking an expungement or sealing unless they had completed their sentence. And if a particular sentence uh, involved some uh, counseling, let's say either substance abuse, mental health counseling, they would not have been discharged from, uh, presumably from DOC custody, but if they were on probation. Um, in other words, it would seem to me that if the sentence has been served, that uh, Department of Corrections and possibly the court uh, there's another bill, I think, as the committee knows, that is circulating on um, discharge from probation. And uh, so presumably the court would have been involved earlier on in the process. Um, but I don't, I, quite frankly, I don't know what it means to add in that last clause if it finds the person successfully completed any rehabilitation. Um, I, I don't think it's necessary. I don't know what we're supposed to be finding or how we're supposed to be finding it or who has to prove uh, to the court's satisfaction. A finding is essentially a conclusion and a conclusion has to be based on facts and the facts have to be presented either by the state or the defense or both. But um, we can find that the person has com uh, completed rehabilitation, but someone has to satisfy us uh, in producing that evidence. So I, I don't know uh, whoever uh, added that language, what they were hoping to achieve by that. I don't think you would lose anything by just saying the court may grant the petition without a hearing, period. And then if the court, upon review of whatever's filed, uh, has some question, uh, they could uh, hold a hearing um, in that respect. I guess the last thing I would point out is, if I've read this correctly, this is all part of uh, amendments to uh, sec section 7602. And in reviewing that quickly while I was uh, listening to the witnesses, there are other instances in, in the course of, of the expungement and sealing statute where it talks about, uh, for instance, um, expungement or sealing can be granted if restitution has been paid in full, goes on to say in more than one place that the court finds sealing of a criminal history serves the interest of justice. So I don't think we want two different standards for a court to determine that expungement or sealing should take place, certainly within one statute. I don't think we'd want it even in two statutes. So I would suggest if the courts, I mean, excuse me, if the legislature's primary interest is in uh, granting someone, uh, if you will, an early expungement or sealing, um, and it comes to the court as a stipulation, which this um, does come to the court as a stipulation, then I think if you just leave it as the court may grant without a hearing, then it's up to the court's discretion whether there's some issue that they see that they need, perhaps maybe it's just clarification, but uh, without defining uh, what the criteria is. 
So I would suggest that last clause be struck. And I'm glad to answer any questions on that, that part of it. And I am, uh, thank you for the change on, the, on page 20, the notifying the court by electronic means or first class mail. I think that will achieve the, the, the goal of, of notifying the person of their potential for expungement. The last piece, um, it's been added under section seven, the exception for research entities. I'm reading that and I'll, I'll read it again, um, that that relates to data that is already in the possession of the research entity. In other words, they're not coming to us after uh, the expungement has taken place. But at least that's the way I'm reading that. And I, I want to be sure that I'm reading it correctly. Uh, excuse me, um, perhaps Bryn is able to respond to that. So that is, that's also how I'm reading it because it refers to the expungement requirements set out in the section, which are requiring um, any um, database to be um, with, with one of these records that's been expunged to, to clear that record from the database. So that's also how I, how I am reading that section. And I believe that was the intent as well. Otherwise that would be a significant change in the ability to access expunged records. Um, so as long as that's the reading, that would not have an impact on us. And I may have commented on this before. It's not one of the highlighted sections today, but the very last uh, paragraph on page 26 under uh, section four, this is the study um, that's called for, talks about implementing an automated process, not requiring a petition um, that involves the court notifying uh, the prosecution office of the opportunity to oppose. Um, Two things I guess I would remind the committee that then would probably not be automated uh, because we have to notify the prosecution now it's possible under a new case management system that um, the, the, the notice itself could be automated but it wouldn't be an automatic process. What is more concerned to me is what I don't want to happen is if we notify uh, the prosecution for instance that uh, this case is appropriate for expungement uh, we would want it to be a, a notice that says, if you do not uh, uh, file or, or give us notice that you're opposing this, uh, we're going to expunge it by a date certain. In other words, that would make ultimately the, the ability to expunge uh, automatic. What we don't want to happen is they're given notice that we're going to expunge and then they do not respond. And so we're left probably scheduling a hearing. So I think if the committee still has it in mind that they could look at that language and make sure that there's some obligation uh, on the part of the state to respond in a timely fashion, or we will expunge or seal. Um, and I'll make one last pitch to include, as long as we're amendment, amending this bill to include the provision to extend the timeline in the uh, the marijuana expungement bill from last year. And those are the only comments I have. I will review it again. Um, and if I feel there's other matters I need to bring to the committee's attention, I will uh, let the chair know. But I'm available for any questions if anybody has any at this time. Thank you. Thank you so much. Just giving committee members the opportunity to raise their hands and not not seeing anybody yet. Well, thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Madam Chair. And if you need any further explanation on those sections about the early discharge, I'll be glad to respond to those as well. Okay. Now, you're, actually, your testimony about the rehabilitation was, was, very, was very helpful. Thank you. 
and I do have to leave for another meeting. So if you need me again, let me know. Okay. Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you very Thank much. You. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Okay, that leaves us with the state's attorneys. So we have both John Campbell and Evan Meenan. I'm not sure how. Um, Madam Chair, I think uh, Evan is, I don't believe he's here. He, he was at another meeting. We've had a split. Um, uh, and I apologize, my video has been going on and off with my, uh, with this, uh, I've got, I'm on my Mac right now, so it's not working. So I apologize, but uh, I'm sure you don't need to see me. Um, anyway, there, there are a couple things. Number one, I, I think you all have made uh, some incredible improvements uh, from our standpoint uh, with uh, looking at some of the, uh, the individual misdemeanors as you did. Um, however, I, I would like some more time to look at this. There are certain things that have been raised, um, you know, by the AG's office, and of course, just now by the court that uh, we want us we'd want to review. Um, and, and in fact, if any of the recommendations that the court just made, uh, some of which I absolutely agree with on the procedural issues, um, then we would want to um, review that as well. Uh, so if 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 possible, I, I will defer um, my comments um, more specifically until we've had a real chance to, to go through this, um, if that's okay, Madam Chair. Absolutely, so we will be working on this uh, tomorrow. So I hope that will give you some time, um, both in the morning and, uh, and the afternoon. So um, our uh, committee assistant, Evan O'Connor will be We'll be in touch with you. That, that sounds good, and we'll we'll reach out. Thank you, Madam Chair. I appreciate the uh, the courtesy. Sure. Thank you so much. So before we adjourn, I'm going to turn to the Attorney General's office, David Sher, just to just to see if you if you have any um, comments given given the testimony that we that we did here today. Sure. The the only one that struck me was that I thought that uh, Judge Gerson's point about the waiver proceedings was a very reasonable one in terms of how courts would deal with that language and his alternative suggestion uh, for language that makes sense. I think we'd have no objection to a change along those lines. I understand there's a lot of interest being balanced here, um, but we would have no objection to a change along the lines that he suggested. Thank you. Thank you so much. Any questions before we, before we adjourn? Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Thank you to the witnesses. And so we can now adjourn.